Wednesday of all days <laughs> to do a presentation. So uh, I make no apologies for that. I was asked to do it and not um, didn't volunteer to do it today. But at the same time, I'm glad to be here. Amongst good friends, colleagues, people I've worked with many, many years ago, people online who are um, good friends and colleagues of mine. So um, I'm really pleased to be able to do this. So a little bit about myself for those who don't know. Well, I've got 26 slides about that. <laughs> um, no, actually, just a couple of minutes. So uh, I started in BR on the 13th of February. Think about this. 13th of February, 1984. So you can do the math. And that's 40 years yesterday. So if I was a bit of a C, I'd probably be life expired, but I'm not quite that age yet. So uh, um, I think I'll uh, I'll move on from that. So I started as a, a young trackman at Flittick near Bedford. John Dolan, who's sitting here, remembers me then uh, when he worked for HMRI, and he worked as a um, a, a senior techie most and he stayed ahead of me most of the time and then we we separated and then we ended up meeting up when i was at interfleet so john's probably the person who knows me the most um i moved from that as a trackman i moved up through the grades basically and ended up as a um, project engineer on the middle main line between st pancras and derby so i spent a lot of time mr counter I don't know if he's on here at all, but uh, Mr. Counter was my boss at one point, and my job was to do heavy maintenance uh, to take TRS, TSRs off where possible. And there was plenty of them. So uh, the work was interesting. It wasn't straightforward renewals. It was sometimes think outside the box, but we did that. We did it collectively with some of the people who are in the room, some of the people who are online. So I'm, I'm quite pleased about that. From there, I moved on to um, the uh, Great Eastern. I was a track engineer with Great Eastern um, when it was Belfer BT. And I looked after the track from Liverpool Street to Norwich and basically had plenty of interface with all the track guys that knew anyway from my early career. And then I moved across to the West Coast Main Line. Where I finished as the, uh, went from Belfer BT to Carillion. We all know what happened with Carillion. And then it became um, network rail, rail track, and then network rail. So I ended up on the West Coast Main Line as the assistant track engineer to James Dean, of all people, Milton Keynes. So if people who know network rail, um, engineers will know James well. When James moved up the ladder, I'd become the uh, track engineering manager for um, the West Coast Main Line, and then I moved into track services, which covered a, a whole range of different things from tamping, ultrasonics, uh, you name it, it came my way, and I basically got on with it. So then went into consultants. I left, went into, I joined into Fleet, I've become a consultant. Went off to um, Royden Tram, I went to the DLR uh, when I first joined there, and then I moved on to, um, I went off to Australia and a few other places across uh, across the world, and then I really enjoyed my time. So I think I've learned a little bit in that time. That's enough about me. So I'll bring you to the um, presentation. So this isn't quite a potted history of the DLR. It's more a progression of the DLR, where it's come from and where it's going to. So I think that's a, a fair way to describe it. And I'll, this behaves itself, it should be okay. Tell me if you can <coughs> see the slides. So I'll move them on one by one. So, as an introduction, DLR, as some people will know, some won't, but it was, started in humble beginnings back in 1987 and then as the world's first accessible railway. In the first year it carried 
6.6 million passengers equating to over 0.8 service uh, million service kilometers with um, a network comprising of 13 kilometers of railway, two routes north and south and 11 single cars and stations. I'll bring you to that a bit later on. Moving on 25 years, it trans uh, following several route extensions and I'll talk those through in a bit of detail in a minute. Um, up to 100 million passengers a year with, uh, and this was at the heart of the 2012 Olympics, transporting a staggering half a million passengers a day at its peak. Unbelievable amount of um, change from when it first started in 1987. And that equated to 5.7 million service kilometers. Um, and then the network extended uh, and it also included the strategically important Cannon Town to Stratford International Route, which was opened in 2011, just in time for the Olympics. So it was a big success story in the BLR, and I'm proud to uh, be able to pass that on. Today's railway is almost unrecognisable to that of 1987, with six extensions equating to 77 service kilometres, with approximately 40 percent on ballasted track and 55 on fixed um, slab track, mostly elevated. The three tunnel sections, some twin bore, some single bore, and 45 stations with a number of either two or three and sometimes four platforms um, associated with that. So I've given you some examples. I will give you some examples of, um, you know, how the asset change brought about obsolescence and innovation and the requirement to optimise. So, you know, it's a long time since this railway was built. So it was always seen as a new railway in um, a good condition, and it still is. And it needs to stay that way for the remainder of its life. Who knows how long that will be, but certainly we, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'm part of that, and some of the people in this room, We've got the, kid, the guys from Elvis, our maintainer, who look after it very well over a, um, throughout their um, time here as our franchisee, and have done, you know, considerably, and we work closely together. This is not a contractor and um, client relationship in the way we know it. This is a collaborative working, and it works really well. And I, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to say that, and I'll be the first to argue if anybody says anything different. So, a bit of background. Um, it, the following feeds directly into our strategic thinking, and that strategic thinking is not about just me and asset engineering uh, or even TFL. It's about our um, collaborative um, maintainer as well, who feed into this in a number of ways, including capital uh, capital replacements. They um, come up with the um, requirements for a, a, a capital replacement and spend expenditure, and we validate it and take it through the, the, um, the system. Um, so Keolis, a bit about them, they track signaling power, civils, operations, if I've left anyone out, they'll talk about third parties and the various other things, but by and large, they're the main um, functions that I work with on a daily basis. Um, and my colleague, Andrew Mitchell, who, who's here now, has just joined me. He's um, now, there's two of us as track asset engineers on the senior track and asset engineer with Andrew in support. Um, so we work with the operations teams, we work with the RSR, RSRP teams, and we've got Zoe here who's um, building us our nice shiny new depot for the brand new trains that are about to um, come on the network and starting testing on the network. So we'll give you a bit of background on that in a minute. Uh, the DLR projects teams, I've got um, close collaboration with the project team, I'll talk that through in a minute, but work not only just with the maintainer, we work across the piece of these different um, stakeholders. 
obviously third parties, local authorities, TFL Engineering. So we've got Sean here as my line manager actually for TFL Engineering. Um, and he's he represents the uh, head of permanent way engineering and the asset lead supports that um, helps me to do my job on a daily basis. So I'm, I'm pleased to have that level of support. So it's not just a one man band about the levels of support that you need to do that to keep a sustainable railway going. Capital replacement plans and sponsors, people like that, where they have to battle through the um, current climate of uh, inflation and expenditure, and I'll come to that in a minute. But um, they, you know, we work very closely together and it comes together very, very well. And the usual regulatory bodies, the RR, the RSSB, RIB, I hope we don't have too much interface with them, but um, we do from time to time. And VAB and PAB um, bodies for approval of um, vehicles and plant and vehicles. Um, so, 10 bullet points. It sounds like I haven't got much to do, but actually, if you look at, into all these things, it, it, it builds a picture of quite a complex um, railway with lots to do and there's lots to consider. So day to day engineering, as I've said with Keolis, Amy, uh, I'm the lead DCP for the assurance and derogations, and I'll come to that in a minute, um, which basically I'm the designated competent person to make sure that our um, track requirements are, are met. Uh, and I'll take them through our um, very good cap very excellent cap process. Managing supply chain deliverables. That's a great one at the moment. We've got, um, you know, with the, in the current climate, we've got a change in supply chain. So, you know, Keolis, uh, Amy are having to deal with that on an hourly basis. I'm dealing it more in a sort of, well, what do we do next? Who do we talk to? And we've got a limited number of suppliers that are changing um, the face of that supply chain is changing constantly. Third party developments, well, the, the DLR is just, there's things springing up all over the place on the DLR. Um, clearances and all these other nice things have to be considered. And um, the changing um, dynamic of the sort of Canary Wharf and all the sort of very busy areas is one that uh, we're constantly working with. Future extensions and commercial developments. Well, the only future um, extension that I can sort of talk about and not in huge detail is the Thamesmead extension, which is um, just gone out for consultation last week, actually. So the options of, around that are not crystal clear at the moment. So I can't go into that in huge detail, but at least it's on the radar. And of course, our new train fleet and service have been um, procured and um, are being made in ready or getting ready for that um, additional amount of travel, uh, passenger footfall, sorry. Um, technical requirements. Well, <laughs> how long have you got? <coughs> and track standards management. <coughs> Excuse me. So this year currently we've gone through a quite a considerable um, overhaul of the track standards, which um, the standards to some extent haven't changed considerably since the railway started, but they um, and they're in a, a position where they're all there's always room for um, updates. Obviously, with Network Rail and London Underground constantly changing their um, standards and procedures, we try to fall in line with that the best that we can, and um, we work with that constantly. So. Uh, <laughs> That alongside um, the day job is um, quite a considerable piece of work. Track project interface. So um, the DLR asset engineering input is to develop validated capital replacement projects through the capital replacement process. So um, the CRP process, it's literally that time of year now where we look at any additional amounts of uh, capital expenditure required for um, any big 
items of work that are bigger than what the, uh, the maintainer can manage, but certainly what we can afford to do within our current budgetary constraints, I might say. Um, we prepare costed um, project requirements, which is a high level costed requirement for doing things for the next three to five years. So I've done some for the new SNC um, switches and crossings um, replacements. Uh, these have been validated and gone through the um, the assurance process to make sure what we're asking and of the um, anybody who comes to do this work is doable and, and you know within uh, the reasonable sort of price range as well. Um, our tender IDR, so obviously you know that's a fairly standard thing that um, most track engineer would do, but certainly they they can be um, short um, IDRs for a single turnout to some quite considerable BTRs and various other complex layouts that need to be done. We work very well with the project team to um, deliver that with the project engineers. Um, and through the, the CAP, and I'll talk that through in a minute, as I said, um, through the CAP process, we got um, uh, acceptance of design, acceptance for test, acceptance of asset and close of project as the main sort of gates that have to be achieved. Um, for any type of considerable amount of work. There are some others more complex in there where we bring in operations and other things to do with that, but certainly those are the main areas that I need to cover off with the project teams. And we work closely with those project engineers to develop the renewal specifications right through to delivery. So we don't just say, here is some requirements, off you go, tell us when you've done it. We work with them constantly along the way and work with some of the constraints that are there, as does Keolis. They, um, they do it through their, um, um, you know, usual hand over hand back issues. And uh, we've got a clever, good engineering team over it, over the car park, we call it, um, that actually support not only me, but they support the project team in the same manner. Um, engineering challenges. So I think all of these will be common to most of the people sitting in the room or on the um, on the um, on the team's um, call. The um, inflation. So that's probably the biggest one at the moment. Costs, increasing costs of materials, resources, transportation and fuel, etc. Just to name a few. These are things that obviously have a big bearing on whether we can afford to do anything. And you know, in the current climate across any industry, they're having to deal with that. Changes in supply chain, and I talked about that before, but what's available and what are the lead times? Are they realistic? Um, carbon reduction. So this is in no particular order, but carbon reduction is right up there at the moment. It's not just a, a line on a, a slide, it's something that we have to work with, uh, and we're having to work with it quickly and adapt. What we need to um, do for the future. We've got global and our own internal TFL targets to meet. We've got to have supply chain commitment, so it's no good us just saying we want to do it in a certain way. We have to do it across the piece. Uh, <laughs> methodologies. We've got to change how we do things sometimes in a big way, and probably sometimes overnight to meet some of the uh, um, challenging targets ahead. Requiring a rapid culture change. I think the culture thing is probably the biggest thing. Um, we, people are used to doing things in a certain way and just sort of churn out the sausages at the end of the machine. But you have to start thinking so much differently about what you're going to do, not only now, but for the future. So, you know, things like global warming, asset performance, hot and cold air temperature conditions, storms, flooding, and revised seasonal preparedness, not just summer preparedness, every season preparedness. We have to know in advance what we're going to do and be ready for that to keep the railway running at its um, optimum service and, and um, keep the passengers and customers happy. Understanding all the weather factors affecting asset life, that's continuously changing. And I think that comes back to the rapid culture change. I think we just don't want to sleepwalk into this going forward. We have to actually understand it, understand what's ahead of us and not just say, 
this is how it was last year or whatever, because things are changing. Records are being broken all the time in that area. And pre and post pandemic lessons learned. So this thing has been done in a different way. Lots of people who were available, not available, different skill sets having to come in, trying to do things uh, to keep a railway running when there was um, huge global challenges. So those are things that we talk about and we still deal with on a day to day basis, despite the fact that um, the pandemic's been and gone some time. Not really gone away, it's just, you know, we're working with the, the fallout from it, if you like. So asset assurance talks about our asset assurance. So under ROGS, there's a requirement for us to cooperate with um, ourselves and our stakeholders, particularly our um, CAD or Keolis, our um, maintainer, to make sure that we're, you know, we don't fall foul of uh, ROGS um, railway and other guided systems, train system uh, regulations. We have to make sure that we, you know, we cover those off because we'll have the ORR down on our backs that as quickly as, you know, overnight if we don't get that right. So that's not a challenge. It's something we do as part of our um, day job. So I'll just go to the um, cap process, which is a um, change of uh, acceptance or change approval process. So DLR cap process is widely considered as industry best practice. I won't say that tongue in cheek. There's a lot of people that recognize that. Um, there's people who don't know enough about it, but there's certainly within TFL, it's hung up there as being uh, the way forward. And it's not just a DLR initiative, it's a joint collaborative working with our um, maintainer and uh, to make sure that everything is approved in, in the proper manner and assured in the proper manner. So the DLR assurance gates are the formal decision points at which DLR cap makes determinations in relation to each change. At each gate, and I'll go through those in a second, are a set of defined acceptance criteria and is applied to each change where the cap panel is satisfied and that the criteria or prerequisites have been met. CAT will make either a go or a no go determination. So it goes to a panel and if it isn't, or if it doesn't satisfy the panel or the people or the stakeholders who are there, it doesn't go any further. It basically has to meet all that criteria. There's sometimes such complex <coughs> projects, not just track, but every type of um, function that I've talked about and discipline that has to um, satisfy the criteria within our cap process. So typically we've got my glasses on for this because can't see. Right. So typically we've got a risk matrix and the different gates here. Generally we work around the line three here, which is substantial significant risk. We're not, you know, from my point of view, from a track point of view, I'm just looking to bring assets into operation for either replacement, new and novel assets and things like that. I don't get heavily involved in the operation side, although I'm party to listening to what that is. And if there's a track interface, we get involved in it. But by and large, line three is basically a notification of change. We're going to do this. We're going to do it then. That's about it, really. Um, the um, acceptance in principle speaks for itself. So it goes to that basically after a notification. AOD, we all love and are aware of that acceptance of design. So it's been to its IDRs and all the various other forum before it even gets the cap. Acceptance for testing, so certain products need to be tested or certain Things need to be tested before they're actually accepted and there's periods of testing with quite sometimes simple or complex test plans around it to uh, ensure that it does what it says on the tin. Well, lots of um, feedback and uh, monitoring to make sure that it's ready for purpose. Only then does it go to acceptance of asset. So acceptance of asset is basically when all the ducks are lined up and all the things are done that need to be done. 
uh, and all the assurance has been met, then that will be accepted as an asset. But it doesn't end there. It needs to be then closed out as a project. So COC, you close it out as a project, and that's your health and safety files and all the usual um, documentation that's around that. And that's not just a tick in the box. That's quite complex in its own self. So I think that's enough about CAP, but that's basically, that takes up quite a lot of my time in particular, but I'm quite pleased and proud to be part of it. And it's a very good forum that we all, um, we know is necessary and we meet everybody who's involved in it, including many of the people in this room, um, are pleased to, you know, get things over the line and it's quite satisfying. So our asset knowledge, BIM, well, we know about BIM, but it's our DLR asset information repository. I'll use it in the broader sense that it's pretty much all our asset information in one place. Saying that, it's supported by geographical information mapping. So we have some mapping. I've got a slide that demonstrates that a bit better in a minute. Uh, our asset information register manuals and reports. So all the things that you need to have and all the historic drawings that some of the people here help put together and some of the people who put together will put it together going forward and some of the new as belts and things will go in there and have to be through the cap process have to be reviewed uh, DLR Metro so a DLR is a, a CAD managed system basically that we um, as asset engineers have access to and we make sure that the um, you know that their day-to-day -day management of the railway from a track perspective. I can't talk for the other disciplines so much, but I think the pro process is very similar. From a track process, for the, the, we work collaboratively together to make sure that Maximo is giving out the right information and any non-compliances and things like that are identified and worked through. Um, 25 year plan. So we have a 25 year plan. When I first arrived on the DLR, it used to be a 10 year plan. It's now a 25 year plan. That's quite the right thing to do to bring in things like incorporating global um, warming and all these other things into place and targets, carbon reduction uh, targets, all fit within the 25 year plan. And we have to make sure that that 25 year plan is sustainable to do that. We have to then, you know, make sure that our assets are in good condition to um, for that to happen. And we got then the usual SharePoint and various other um, forum for putting documentation. So we we've got a large repository of information to call upon, and generally people are very um, aware of how to to get that information. If you're not, then you talk to somebody. We've got a very good excellent team from BIM team that um, will point us in the right direction. And that's it in a nutshell. So our mapping, that, I mean, that's just a, a basic outline map of the, the network with the north, south, east, west route with a couple of other supporting routes as well. Those can be magnified down right down through um, Google mapping almost down to, um, you know, be able to see what's actually going on on the track. Uh, at the locations, and I think most railways and systems got something similar. But I believe our one is, you know, with the team that it, it, it's got so much potential to make it um, a, something that's usable for everybody, and not just a map. And again, that feeds into the asset information. So this is the um, the sort of uh, just a snapshot of um, Maximo, which. The whole thing it's just a revolving circle of that information based on you know in the input that that goes into it from our colleagues in CAD through to ourselves to know what to do for capital expenditure. Um, right a brief history I'm not going to go into that in huge detail but I think a lot of people know 1987 there was a 13 station scenario I talked about 1991 was bank extension 1999 Lewisham CGLR then is now all part of um, Keolis's portfolio now so that's um, you know that's where it's moved on to a couple of years back that 
changed hands over to ourselves. So that's that orange portion down there. So um, it's all part of um, Kyoto Sami's maintenance boundaries and I'll certainly our um, portfolio with them. Uh, and the Stratford Woolwich Arsenal, sorry, London City Airport. Um, brilliant, you know, lovely bit of railway that takes passengers to a, an airport right next to the railway and then, you know, sees lots of happy faces going off from where they need to go. And uh, it doesn't take them very long to do it. So it's it's very amenable and very easy for people. Woolwich Arsenal, as we know, and that's going, taking us right across to um, the south side of the Thames, which you know, anybody who's been down there, that that area has been redeveloped and is being redeveloped. And certainly Thames Mead will be part of that going forward. Um, and also the two and three car upgrades. And as my colleague over here knows, it was a design and build, uh, sorry, design and construct contract right from the beginning for, virtually for all of these extensions. So, so we've had to work closely with all our um, uh, principal contractors to make sure that all these things were um, all these extensions were fit for purpose and they're all running well now as people would know. Right, so I'll talk about the track. I'm not going to go into huge detail on this, but what I will do is just talk about the track generally. Um, we have 80 pound rail, so uh, 39E1 rail as it's um, most people who know it is eighty pound, so that in itself brings its own suite of problems in terms of how you manage it. Because we have got pockets of hundred and thirteen, sometimes on one or two routes more than just a pocket, but by and large it's thirty nine E one eighty pound rail, which then requires its own um, set of bespoke components to go with that. <laughs> So it's not just a case of that's what the rail is. It's on right. It's on um, elevated track, but that's on fixed slab in many cases. That means that you can't go to something like 113 pound as an alternative because you've got platforms and clearances and all the other things, nice things that go with it that you have to consider. So uh, it does bring a lot of challenges into play, but it's also very makes it very interesting as well. Um, so we can't just buy off the shelf design, so we, we can get and most of our um, supply chain um, help us out with this quite considerably in terms of making sure that uh, any new type products, anything that comes along that can we can use will fit our railway and we're not looked at as, oh well, we can't do that. We got a bigger fish to fry with. LU and um, Network Rail, they actually work with us quite well. So that is a real achievement and that's our project teams. Us, the new depot at Beckton and Zoe will go into that in some detail after mm -hmm. um, You know, it's about working with that, that um, bespoke railway, um, sorry, rail um, profile. Um, compatible real wheel rail interface. So we've got a DLR5 um, wheel profile here. And as you can see, we had an original ATA um, profile, which is very slightly different. So the profile here was modified to the blue section to actually be a better interface with the rail corner or, or the um, wheel um, gauge corner. So we needed to, or the wheel flange, sorry. So we needed to make sure that, um, you know, we, we, we're getting the best um, ride quality and um, value from that in terms of how we're, you know, how it's um, forming, certainly for the new trains. And um, the wear rates are assessed annually, certainly by our colleagues. Uh, who assess it annually and that then feeds into the re-railing program and it's a constant re-railing program so it's not um, just we're going to re-rail it forget about it for 10 years some places we're re-railing as often as three or four, five years 
simply because of the um, tight curvature and the difficulties that we have of maintaining that rail head. Rail milling is the preferred method. Gone away, I wouldn't say totally gone away from grinding, but we're certainly um, using rail milling, and uh, that's been progressed through our Keolis um, teams to um, bring that machine on and do a far better job of um, profiling the railhead. And we've got an, an ongoing annual program to deliver that. So 400 HT, so that's probably the newest kid on the block, if you like, in terms of rail type. Not everybody's cup of tea. I've heard everybody, um, I've heard different things from different people about 400 HT. It's not always the best thing to develop a hardest rail possible that will, because it has a, a net effect on how it perform, how trains, train wheels perform on that. So we've been using it, but it has its own set of constraints and difficulties in using it. You have to use a different welding process for argument's sake. Um, you can't use it, you can't machine it for s &C or any expansion joints or anything like that. You have to use it just for plain rail installation. So it's a, it's got its own particular set of constraints. So um, we do work with it. We've got some on trial at the moment. The early indications are it's um, doing OK, but we, we're still um, getting around it to see it. But uh, there's been some reduction in um, RCF that I could see on those particular um, that particular rail type. But corrugation seems to be something that we deal with that um, seems to be common to all rail um, profiles. So we're still understanding what the net effect of that is, but we're trialing it and we're using it. Uh, but we're not actually installing any at the moment until we get our trials uh, validated, really. So I think I've covered a lot of that. We've got, you can see we're in some big numbers with the numbers of points and crossings and expansion joints and tunnels and various other things. So I think I've covered that already, but um, it's not, it's no mean feat to manage that. And the outline track design, so it's 1435 gauge, not 1432. And that in itself brings certain amounts of, um, I wouldn't say difficulties, I'd say more constraints with suppliers and how we manage the wheel transfer over switches and crossings. So we um, work with that. But these like for like replacements, it's very sort of straightforward. But in terms of if you want to convert to out in the open where you can put 113 pound. It's not quite straightforward as to buy in a 113 pound layout, which is traditionally 1432 layout. And the cants and gradients and things like that, I, I can go through them in more detail, but basically this is just a, um, a, a snapshot of the various track design um, features that we have on the on the DLR. And check rails on curves I should say less than 75. Oh, yeah, 75 meters radius or less. So um, that's different from the likes of network rail. And slab track, we have derailment um, upstands or curves uh, everywhere that we, you know, there's slab track on the elevated section. And the different component types. So we talked about the radius. Pre-curved, head hardened on curves less than 150 meter radius. Um, that's pre-curved. Um, CWR on slab 113A on the XBR lines, Shadwell to Limehouse. That's one of the sections I was mentioning. Which is not a pocket, it's quite a, a bit of railway, but it's on the old XBR line. Um, 113A flat bottom wood mill lane diversion. So that was built. Uh, and um, quite a number of years ago in preparation for the new cross-trail development. So um, we were quite pleased with the, the way that that's gone, but there's still, you know, has its own separate set of challenges. Inclined S and C, we have um, all the different types of CV down to 40 meter radius, 100 meter radius, 245 and 331. So I would say 40 and 100 are the primary um, 
radius that we have to work with. So that in itself, you know, that's on that tight curvature requires some good strategic thinking and lots of good um, eyes to look at it and make sure that it isn't wearing out and, and measure, you know, through um, S53 type measurements and, and the like where we follow um, network rails criteria on that. Um, cast crossings with weldable legs, so we have the TMZs uh, on the extended legs on some of the S and C on some of the crossings, most of the crossings, and um, that in itself, one that we have to keep a weather eye on just to make sure that our TMZs are staying in good condition. Our colleagues over in CAD have worked closely with us over the last few months. Uh, we have all of our SNC is protected, so we have no strengthened SNC. It's all protected by adjustment switches. So in that, in so much as yes, doesn't give rise to big problems with stressing, but it also introduces a considerable amount of additional assets to look after. So we have to just be aware, mindful of that, and swing those crossings. I'll come to those in a minute, but. Uh, we we certainly got those and we've now got a um, few replaced, but I'll, I'll come to that. And the hydraulic clamp lock mechanisms, HWs on the actual swing noses, so we have to um, consider that. So rolling stock, I'll just bring you through that. Our tonnages here are quite um, telling. So, you know, the west route, obviously, we've got the highest tonnage in the railway. We have on the east route and the fairly average east route, north route, and um, Stratford International. So obviously the south route down to Lewisham and the um, west route, sorry, the, the route through to um, um, Woolwich Arsenal is heavily used. Of course, that's, that takes in the city airport, so the numbers, the increased number of trains that are required to, to meet that meet passenger demand. The stock, so we've got a nice picture of the original P86, P891 car, which probably a museum piece now somewhere. I don't know, I haven't seen one around to, to, to know, but it's probably somewhere. Um, and then that was upgraded to a two car um, B92 stock which the B23s, the new ones I'm going to show you in a moment, will replace. So that's the ongoing program. We're still in the early stages of procuring and testing the B23. So that will take a bit of time to manifest itself, but it will happen. And the B2007 three car stock will work simultaneously with the B23. So two, those two fleets will be our primary fleets by circa 2026 it depends on quite how delivery and um, testing goes but by and large that's the target to meet the Thames Mead um, extension um, B23 stock so there's a nice picture of a B23 train they are lovely trains I've not been allowed on it I keep getting my wrist slapped every time I've been asked to go on it but we've got two or three of them on there network now going through try and testing, but uh, I will be getting on them. We're, they, these will be fitted. I mean, they're modern in every way. I can't tell you all the niceties. I know they're air conditioned and there's some good features around them, but certainly the um, one for the track side is we're going to have a automatic um, monitoring system on there, which will, um, you know, bring a, a whole new way of looking at the railways um, infrastructure and with some instantaneous results on that, which brings us into, you know, the way that we should be going forward. My colleagues over at Geldis as well are doing a similar uh, thing with uh, their own ATMS system, which is very similar to the um, LU system. So we're hoping that the two systems together will speak to each other well and will um, they're both being developed simultaneously and uh, one being a bit more sophisticated than the other the aims one is fairly basic information but uh, the ATMS one should give us a lot more 
Uh, today we've got three on test uh, and following the delivery of the B23 trains, the total capacity will be 31% higher than it is today with 43 new trains and 61% higher with 54 new trains, which is due by 2026. Providing a fleet size of circa 75 trains, that includes the B2007, in either a two or three car configuration. So, you know, new trains, it brings about new challenges, things to other things to think of. So um, our civils colleagues have looked at the viaduct loading um, for this new train. So, it, you know, I learn every day um, things like multiple train braking can have a big effect on how um, structures and viaducts loadings are, um, whether they're affected or not. So this is just an example of looking at horizontal loads and um, all the structures and braking and traction and those, all the centrifugal forces and derailment, all those factors put in there to understand, make sure our viaducts are fit for purpose to actually take these. Not being a civil engineer, I would say that, um, you know, the information that I've received in conjunction with the track information that I had to provide around the um, the um, loading uh, factors um, between us, we, we we got to a good place on that. Not going to go into huge amounts of um, detail here, but there's certainly this is how the route looks, and these grey numbers here are the current services. I say pre-COVID, but they they haven't changed much since then. These are the current trains per hour on the um, on the network. So you'll see that there's some light train services there and these considerable down to Lewisham and again the same down to Bank. You can see by 2026 it, how that increases. So there's going to be 30 on the um, basically on the uh, Bank route. Lewisham will be 30. Per hour we're talking, so this is a complete re um, configuration of the train service pattern. And there's your um, Thames Mead, so that's about as good as I can give you as a map of Thames Mead. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> but by and large, there will have to be a service that covers both Beckton and Thames Mead. So that's the um, just a snapshot of what it will look like. Obsolescence, that could be me. <laughs> so I'm not sure about obsolescence, but certainly I've been thinking about it. You know, as I said, I could be the same age as a bit of S&C, so am I obsolete now? I don't know, but anyway, I thought I'd end up. Um, obsolescence, so that's a biggie that we've got at the moment. One of the biggest factors we got is the uh, swing nose crossing, um, stopping production of swing nose crossings, which some railways people some people have not really seen much in the way of swing nose crossings we we for our sins had eight of them on the uh, canary wharf basin as i call it and as you can see you know they cover the entire railway so uh, the 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 entire platform area north and south of canary wharf so the problem was there was eight in the basin serving all respective platforms supply obsolescence meant there's no crossing patterns and designs available and quite honestly it was probably a good opportunity to do something about this and just put standard um, fixed nodes crossings in but that again brings about its own signaling design and various other factors that have to be considered so the solution was to re uh, develop redesign layouts for fixed nose crossings, which match the footprint of the existing. Then, you know, we're not, we can't change the design um, overall. What we have to do is consider where the existing crossing noses and switches are, and work work it work backwards from that, really, um, and replace the existing points with changes in the S and T design. So there's a nice picture of it there. So uh, this was one before. These were done probably three years ago, I believe. And um, 1175 is an equal split, a nice equal split crossing layout just north of um, south of 
sorry, north of um, Canary Wharf platform. And as you can see, there's your um, point machine, there's your HW and all that. So, and the crossing nose goes, it was um, the fixed nose crossing was installed and is performing very well. Reduction in power draw is the benefit from that. So obviously, you're not using as much power. Over eight of these, we're about 50% of the way through the, the placement of the. So probably, probably more than 50% of the way through the. And that's been accelerated. But again, it fits in with our carbon footprint of trying to reduce the amount of power that we're using. And does reduce testing and maintenance requirements because you're not having to check all this S&T equipment and the movable parts that were on the swing node. Um, there are other benefits. So other challenges. <clears throat> the loose top bolts, plate bolts. So what we didn't want to do, the crossing, if you go back to the crossing itself, there was absolutely nothing wrong with those resilient base plates. They were doing, in doing performing how they should. When I say nothing wrong, I, I bring you to these top plates here. So what do we do with that? Do you, you know, you chuck out a, um, a base plate that's probably several hundred pounds and buy a new one in when you could actually use the existing base plate to do something better with it. And that fits in with some of the rethinking that we have to <coughs> do today. <coughs> so it's more like a heavy maintenance solution around that and not just a um, throw it away and put new in because that we've gone away from that. Um, so the intermittent binding on the slide chairs. So we did have some issues where we put it, tried to use existing slide chairs and it turned out that the best thing to do was to actually replace them. But slide chairs are relatively easy to change out. You've got all the things like um, the packings and the, um, the grouting to consider, but by and large, it was an easier one to do, but we had to come back later and do that. But that became lessons learned. This was the first one that we did. I hadn't been in down this road before, so we had to do, we've done one, and then since then we've learned those lessons and we've better going forward. So source bespoke blind bolts to secure the top plates, introduce switch rollers compatible with the switches. That was to um, try to um, alleviate the problems with the binding. And develop a route strategy with the you know for temporary designs in the event of single or worst case multiple points failures. It's a very complex area there. You get multiple point failures there. So our, our colleagues in, in CAD and ourselves work together, signaling colleagues work together to come up with scenarios that would actually um, give us some um, flexibility or working around anything that should fail in that area. But this wood. <laughs> it's not happened yet. <laughs> um, so these are the blind bolts. So you can see the older base plate there. Absolutely nothing wrong with the base plate. And these blind bolts, I'm not saying this was always going to be the solution, but it's certainly working now. From what I understand, the, you've got the ability to tie these down. And they were called colleague Tom there would cause them dancing bolts. Uh, but he's quite right. They were rattling around in the top plate and there was nowhere for them to gain any purchase below. So what we had to do was um, come up with a solution and that was one of the solutions. Again, that's thinking outside the box. So, um, you know, that's not about any one individual. That's about several people putting their heads together. That's just an example. Really. Improvements at the moment. So <laughs> we've got some issues. We've got um, bank tunnels, so the, the whole of this area here, which is the head chunk, basically from the platform through to the buffer stop at the back of the um, um, bank stations, platforms nine and ten, um, you've got one S&C layout, which has a 250,000 per annum. You know, an extraordinary amount for a single S&C layout. So that, Combined with the fact that traditionally, well, basically following the Olympics, re-railing occurred down as far as the platform there. And we're now in a position where we need to replace from 1989 rail 
down in that area. So um, very, very strategically important, requiring a lot of thinking. And our, again, our colleagues have worked closely with us. We've had a couple of incidents with different things, broken rails and various bits and pieces that we had to consider. But that's not, no reflection on, you know, what how it's being maintained. It's more about the age of asset and the fact that it's been, you know, needed to be um, a better strategy around it. And that, I believe that's where we're headed. So we'll talk about some of the clearances down in bank. So anyone in LU will say, well, you've got millions, you know, loads of room there. <laughs> I wouldn't like to be that person standing there, to be honest with you, but there you are. But um, certainly the, um, from our perspective, our trains um, are very, very tight in there. We've got this um, walkway that goes down the whole length of the tunnel there, and that basically means that, um, yeah, because there's, there's reverse curves around there as well, so it will count the other way. But the, the Distance there is only something like 700 mil, and that only gives us um, a very, very tight clearance there. And there are places where there's non-compliances that we're working. We've got derogations in place, but we're working um, to try and improve that. We're doing. We're putting together. A, we've got a new gauging standard, and we're working closely with our TfL colleagues and um, Huddersfield University and. And Atkins basically to um, put together a um, uh, a gauging standard that will also not just cover bank tunnel but the entire DLR, and you know be in a better position to understand track position. So design type clearances. We, I've just talked about that original life expired rails at the head channel. Original. Uh, Chairs failing, holding down vault failures, uh, original concrete sleeper degradation, original, original. So it was a case of all of these things, you know, with all the train, these heavy train services I've talked about, need to start being replaced at some point in time. So we're at that point now to decide how best to do that. And we, there were options there in utilising uh, embedment in concrete, excavate the entire sleepers, See, we're cutting new ground here. So our LU colleagues will say to us, deep tube colleagues will say, well, actually, um, you know, this is something we do every day. We don't do this on the DLR very often. So we're taking advice. And again, from our colleagues in TFL engineering to support us on that. So hopefully we'll get ourselves to a good place. But it's not the easiest place to work. As soon as you come out of Bank Tunnel, you're into Royal Mint Street, which is on the edges of the heart of London. So you've got to consider how you're going to get all your spoil away, all your um, materials in. And it's not an easy one to consider. Composite plastic bearers, these are things that um, we're obviously now again a bit of obsolescence around that. So uh, as our network rail colleagues will point out to us that they're no longer going to want to stop in sourcing hardwood timbers. So we'd already got ahead of the game on that. So we started to put um, cycle, um, uh, composite bearers and sleepers in uh, on many of our newer layouts that we've done in the last two or three years. And they're, you know, showing some, you know, nothing different in terms of the way that they perform, I don't believe, but certainly um, a more sustainable and recyclable solution. So rollers, so um, we haven't got for our 80 pound switches, we haven't got a, a TWIA type roller um, design currently for our 80 pound switches. And we've been working, I think we're quite away from that actually happening, but we have come up with, and uh, we've worked um, closely with Delcor and uh, Osterol to come up with a, a bespoke design to actually have a roller that will, in, and people who've never seen these, they, this switch roller, actually it's one that's designed especially that can be retrofitted in probably a couple of hours to the, the network and they've, they've, there's some real benefits from that and reducing friction between rail and um, slide chair. Christmas time, so this was last Christmas, so it was about, I said 50 metres might be a bit 
put a bit of license there, but there's certainly a lot of uh, 30 to 50 metres of new um, top coat slab went in, which is the first time we've done anything like that in terms of that volume. We've done small slab repairs. So that was done in conjunction with a necessary renewal of the S&C in that area. So that's all performing well. This concrete was laid during the worst storm that you can imagine. So it's not wet still, but <laughs> <laughs> it could easily be. But it was done under a tented sort of arrangement and, you know, the curing and um, putting in of the S&C over a nine day blockade was successful. And that was a real credit to our project team who delivered that along with our principal, our principal contractor. And again, our guys from the maintenance side, you know, taking it back into maintenance. We're a bit away from actually full hand back, but certainly it is in a good position. Structural expansion joint. How long have you got? I'm not even there. <laughs> anyway, so I need to sort of get this wrapped up quite soon, but we've got hundreds of structural expansion joints. These are the typical designs. So we've, got, we've now got these two different primary designs on the network, and we're going away from this one for this type of uh, structural expansion joint, which we've now got a standardized um, design for. We're um, installing them across the network. You'll see some of these. I've got um, check rails, but some haven't, and that's sometimes in the trailing or facing uh, position as well. So we, um, you know, there's a lot of thought goes into these, and again, they're a mechanical joint that has to be looked after on a daily basis, almost because there's so many of them and. Uh, they perform very well, but they, they meet their um, requirements to actually allow the structures to breathe. And one of the things we're looking at is low toe load fastenings on the uh, loose side and um, the fixed side, obviously, fixed. It. And we're looking at different ways of actually doing that now. Gauge adjustable base plate. So we've worked extensively on having some gauge adjustable base plates. So there you, there you go, that's introducing a maintenance solution into what was to some extent a fixed solution. So having base plates with no gauge adjustment at all meant that when they start, when the holding down bolts started to fail, you were in a position where you've got no choice but to replace everything. Now we're going to be in a better position where we've got some gauge adjustment that we can work with under maintenance. And the type typical ones, and these are again had to go through our cap process. So, some to some extent, a carbon copy of what's on LU, and they're using them successfully at the moment. But we work with Delcor tie flakes on these, and to put in resilient adjustable base plates to replace in some uh, where the there's failing SG base plate, and the track fixing um, arrangements as well to go with it, because obviously there's some differences in the way that the track fixings, uh, these are held down and the existing ones, uh, SG. And again, uh, we have the integrated rail and check rail chairs. So and in, now to some people will say, well, what's new about that? Well, we common design on the, on the DLR. We had standalone um, check rail chairs sat in between um, standard chairs, which give very little room for maintenance uh, and caused uh, their own particular set of difficulties. This took <coughs> quite a considerable time to get it over the line um, in terms of approval. And some of the fixing and the installation uh, problems that we had around them have been ironed out and they're now approved for use on the DLR. Holding down bolts, so obviously we've gone away from, not completely gone away, but we're replacing the existing holding down bolt system uh, where we can to a screw and dowel system uh, to fit the Delcor gauge adjustable base plate. Um, adjustable stretcher bars, so we've got these, what they call teal stretcher bars on currently, they've now replaced what was the old black stretcher bars, which are 
these are the yellow stretcher bar equivalents, which I believe even those are starting to be phased out now, but certainly they're a better design. Uh, and these were developed by CAD actually, the, the, their engineers put this together as a, a proposal to us. And it was a, a great way of um, placing what was to some extent a bit of a risk um, asset. Now, wherever there's new installations or whether there's refits, these are being fitted and they've been fitted quite successfully. I think we've only had one failure out of dozens that have been put in. Um, we're now looking at adjustable stretcher bars again. Can, we're working to put a 113 design in um, campaign nine network rail adjustable stretcher bar, which is still in its infancy in terms of getting it through our approvals. But certainly we can call on our LU and our London under uh, sorry network rail colleagues for their experiences because both of these are accepted for use on their infrastructure. So for 113 pound layouts, it should be just like for like. Um, the difficulty will come when we try to, these brackets will have to be adapted for 80 pound. So we need to, that's our next port of call after getting these uh, 113 pound designs accepted. But that again offers up some, just a slight, adjustment that might take away some problems around certainly the tight flexures of 40s, whether you're getting bent stretcher bars or whether you're getting um, difficulties to maintain um, or manage wide gauge. How long have we got? Conductor rail. <laughs> Our supplier has suddenly gone out of business in terms of um, supplying our um, 4A conductor rail, which is a bespoke design. So it's nothing like what LU have. It has basically it's a bottom up design, the shoe, um, rail shoe, for those who don't know, um, takes up the bottom of the rail and not the top of the rail as it does in LU. They have a shroud on top, which is of a, a non conductive material that sits there and it doesn't, you, you can't really see the conductor rail, but it's definitely there. <laughs> but by and large, um, we're having most daily conversations about what to do next because the supplier is now saying that in the Far East it will no longer be supplied. So that's not just ourselves, that includes London Underground as well for any um, 4A CCU, which is the, um, the um, hybrid um, conductor rail. Yellow plant, so Again, I won't go into huge detail here. Some of our nice toys that um, work on the network, but saying that these have been working and the guys in CAD, I don't know how they've managed it. I've kept these going for years and they, they're getting to the point where they just about ready to fall over in terms of their uh, performance, but they are managed, being managed and they keep the, main, the railway going. This one's the um, battery loco, obviously has to be used in the tunnel area. Uh, and that one gets heavily used. We can get it working. And the GEC um, diesel loco, another one. And this one here, well, I'm, I don't know why I put that in there because it's been off our network for five years now with a, a supplier that I won't mention um, um, validated it to come back to us. Um, this one. It's the just shows you it's a good picture to show you a tamper. So we haven't got a tamper currently um, for use on the DLR. But certainly the um, this will show you some of the constraints here of managing a tamper. And this is one of the smaller tampers. This is the Beaver tamper. Uh, getting it to work on our tight curvature. So there's a 38 meter radius here, which show, basically the end row of the machine completely conflicts with the um, um, conductor rail. So for a renewal, you probably, you know, we take the conductor rail out, we just tamp away and just crane it in, crane it out, which is expensive. Uh, and you don't get the best benefit from the machine. We want a machine that works on our network uh, and can travel, go to wherever we want it to. And that's 
proving challenging at the moment, but we're still pursuing it and we're working on that as we speak. So we're nearly there now, so future plans, I think I've talked about that. <coughs> I think my colleague Zoe will bring us up to speed with Vectum Depot in course, but by and large, that's a huge piece of work and our interface with them is almost on a daily basis as well, but we're, we're happy to do it. And the um, Thamesmead extension, that looks like just an elastic band laid across there, but <laughs> by and large, it's um, an unknown quantity to me, but anybody who's looked at the consultation documentation, try and make some sense of it, because I can't. And I'll just talk on some of the contributors to this. Well, I've put a few names down. There are a couple of others that I didn't have room to put on there, but by and large, these are some of the people that have helped put this together. I can't do this all on my own. And that's how you work in the TFL and DLR engineering, asset engineering world. Can't do it on our own. It's a collaborative um, experience. Questions? Is that it? OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, please? I know I might be running short of time, but uh, go ahead. Um, yeah. uh, Mr. Um, thank you very much for fascinating presentation. Um, I had a question about the new gauge adjustable base plates. Yes. Um, I think the question was why are you using it? Why is that? Or is it to allow for widening? No, we don't do uh, we don't have gauge widening, so it's for um, we don't have design gauge widening. What we have on slab, and we've got a considerable amount of slab, is lateral movement on the tight curvatures. So where we've got the ability, what we don't want to be doing is completely replacing everything. There's very little wriggle room to do anything about the gauge on a fixed slab layout. So one of the ways to do that, for the to at least buy some time until we have to do major works, is to um, use gauge adjustable base plates, and that will help resolve some of the issues to make sure they don't go out of tolerance, um, standard tolerances. Yeah, yeah. How do you solve that problem and now have contracts that I'm sure you get the detailed drivers, so we're not tied to them for doing the replacements. You're quite right. Some of the so in the more recent, let's be clear, we haven't done copious amounts of SNC renewal, except in the probably the last five, ten years, Tom. Yeah, five years. So problem wasn't apparent there before because we're not we haven't been looking at replacing but certainly in the last five years the interface and the um, as built and the various other things that we get um, and the with the suppliers is much better than it was before but you, yeah there's still certain challenges around that when you're depending on the age of whatever assets in there. We've got a very healthy spares um, regime in place. We've, you know, we've had several occasions where we've had to, the Kyogres have had to go out and replace SNC and they, you know, they've always come up with the goods in terms of that, but we have to keep replenishing that. To replenish it and make sure that you've got the drawings and what, one of the things could be the, the patterns so sometimes we can get the drawings. We can't. They don't always hold the pattern. So that can be an additional cost that we don't, uh, we haven't foreseen, or that we have to sort of cover off. That's right. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I've recently given this to the Early stage for why 
we get it from abroad. Okay, yeah. that's the good. That, that's, that's good. And the 113A, mm. sort of chef, and that was 1970s, which we took over in the 1980s. Oh, no, I don't know, I think that's, and that's still performing, is it? No, it's all so, for the Olympics. So that is, that's all for the Olympics. Except I was at BBC to reroute and hold the West Road. So it was rerouting really brand new 113 in 2011. Mm. Primarily due to my quality and where for the next. And for me, just think about the bank jump there. That took 30, 35 years. Yeah, and it's not was, really you know what, it was, it's not intensive use, I recall. It's not, it's not a well in it. It's other issues, of course. But that's not, not bad, is it? On my, on my yeah, but it has now reached yeah, its critical sure. stage in terms of life so, asset. Uh, that would be just a surprise. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you know, we've got a is the busiest and heaviest used route. Mum, is it 60 meter radius per hour? Or is it 40? 40, yeah. 40 yeah. So nice every, every 250,000 times a year. So we, um, you know, we do some uh, S&T type um, <coughs> analysis, diagnostic checks, and CAD mm -hmm. do that basically from the signal side and share that with us. And it, it su works surprisingly well. Okay. Yes, Mike. Hi, right, so uh, the, the, the swing nose crossings at Canary Hall. Mm. Um, when they have been in place or close to the has there been an increase in the vibration from the crossing compared to the swing nose? That you know. We've done a noise. <laughs> that's how I've got to be careful. We, we've <laughs> done a we've done a noise study quite recently. It never come up in the hit list of being one of the noise areas. What we would say is uh, probably not noticeably. No. Well, we've said no, we don't support the cloud system and it's going by the second generation, mm. sometimes mm. managing the digital. Yeah, that's so that report's also been sent back to the Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> 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 when you can play engineering they play for it, they? Oh. They play for the best. Yeah, the best. Yeah, go on. One of the questions from online is, is this DLR5 profile different from other trains, and how does it differ? So, sorry, say again. Is the DLR5 profile different from trains? It's it was the improved profile. I've got my colleague here who had some dealings with it at DLR5, even if first not not yourself. No. Right, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's it, uh, David, yeah. So in answer to that, I can't really answer it because the uh, uh, it's, it's what I've known since I've been certainly there in and out of the DLR for the last 10, 15 years. Profile problems, and, uh, and the easiest thing to do was to reprofile the cars initially uh, to uh, uh, rather than reprofile. Yeah, the yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Why they, uh, the 80 pound most surprise, surprise, in those days, because they confirmed the 13 rather than the other one. Yeah, and it's going to distract them. Well, I mean, the, the fact that we've now got the 80 pound modified rail. Mm -hmm. Is, 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 is a big plus because it's now been done compatibly with the, uh, and that's the beauty of being part of TFL Engineering because our the dynamics team uh, work closely with us in terms of getting the best wheel rail um, profile or the best wheel rail performance. Thanks. Got no more about the yeah. I'm sorry.